Alright people, welcome back to Maxwell Teaching video. Happy weekend. Today I'm gonna talk about kidney again, I guess probably. But I'm also gonna talk about stone. Wait, what? Do you mean rock? A kickstone? No. Today I would like to discuss about stone in the kidney, or we call it as nephrolithiasis or renal calculi. Do you know about that? Let's go follow the journey of this episode. Don't forget to click like and subscribe button below the video. As I said before in the previous episode, kidneys are tubing-shaped organs that lie behind peritoneum. Kidneys have many crucial functions. One of the main functions is to maintain overall blood balance. Okay, so let's go deeper to look inside. Kidney divided into three major regions or areas which are the other cortex, medulla in the middle, and the renal pelvis in region called hilum. Cortex is other portion of the kidney. It contains glandular tissue and it contains glomerulus, which the function is filter the blood from the arterial effort. It says that this region is also produced an important essential hormone for red blood cell production called erythropoietin. It produced by interstitial fibroblast, close association with the peritubular capillary and proximal convoluted tubule. And the second is renal medulla. Renal medulla is the middle portion of the kidney and it consists of multiple pyramidal tissue mass called renal pyramids, which are triangle structure that contain a dense network of tubules, part of the nephron. Also, the renal medulla extracts oxygen at a ratio of 80%, making it exquisitely sensitive to small change in renal blood flow. And the innermost region is renal hilum. Renal hilum is the kidney's recessed central fissure where its vessels, nerves, and ureter pass from the apex of renal pyramid. Urine pass through renal papilla into minor calyx, and two until three minor calyces coming into major calyx, and then continuing through the renal pelvis into the ureter. And if stones form and block the urine flow in those structures, we call it as nephrolithiasis. Okay, so let's discuss about it. Nephrolithiasis is consists of two words, which are nephron and lid. Nephron is functional unit of the kidney. Lid means stone. Kidney stones are slightly more common in males than females, and it show a male to female ratio of three at one in nephrolithiasis. And most urinary calculi develop in persons age 40 to 50 years. But actually, the disease can affect anyone at any age. Actually, there are a number of things that are most at risk of developing nephrolithiasis, which divided into two groups, intrinsic factors. Intrinsic factors include hereditary, some researcher associated with chromosomal abnormalities in band 4P16 and also age and sex, like I said before. In extrinsic factors include geography, like climate change and increased daily temperatures. Also diet and water intake and your jobs can be the risk. And how exactly people can have nephrolithiasis in their body? So actually it controls by two things, which are things that have inhibitory effect and other things that have stimulatory effect stimulate the forming stone. Inhibitory effect include reabsorption of the ion like calcium and other molecules that believe can inhibit the stone formation like glycosaminoglycan, tarm horsepel protein, ADC. On the other hand, stimulatory effect include the concentration of the ion like calcium, uric acid, and the saturation that can affect it by the pH and urine volume. When the that two things are unbalanced, nucleation of stone constituent crystals can happen. They can grow and aggregate, which the process is called aggregation, 
to a size that can interact and attach to epithelial cells in the kidneys or renal collecting system. It makes retention and then becomes stone. Based on the formation process, stone actually divided into two major groups. The first group is non-infection stone, include calcium oxalate, which is the most common component found, approximately 70 to 80 percent cases. When you do stone analysis examination, you can see an envelope form or halter form. Calcium phosphate is also the other most common stone. And then uric acid stone, which can form in acidic urine at pH levels below 6. The other stones include cysteine, which develops from cystinuria condition caused by decreased proximal tubular absorption of filtered cysteine, and xanthine which results from the effect of xanthine's oxidase enzyme. The second group is infection stone, magnesium ammonium phosphate, MHP, also called struvite, and triple phosphate. It looks like coffin in stone analysis examination. It formed by microorganisms or bacteria called urea splitter which are Proteus sp, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. They can produce urease that generates ammonia from urea, elevating the pH of urine, producing alkaline urine. How we diagnose it? First, we do anamnesis. As usual, patients with urinary stones generally present with classical episode of typical pain called renal colic. It has a sudden onset, we can ask the patient about the characteristic of the pain, severity of the pain with pain scales like NPRS, fast scores, and then the pain becomes steady and unbearable and often is accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Hematuria, generally microscopic but occasionally frank, frequently accompanies stone passage. Hematuria defined as the presence of blood or red blood cells in the urine. Don't forget to ask their history of comorbid disease like hypertension, obesity, diabetes. Also ask their diet or food intake history like vegetables, nuts, beans, or mineral like salts. And we do physical examination, include general examination. We examine the vital signs of patient. We examine the patient from head to toe. And then we do specific examination, especially in flank region. We usually find the tenderness on costovertebral angle, ipsilateral from affected kidney. We can do additional examination, include laboratory testing. We do blood testing to see patient complete blood count, erythrocyte, leukocyte, thrombocyte, also electrolyte like calcium and uric acid serum level. Don't forget to see renal function on creatinine and urium. We also can do urinalysis to see hematuria, leukocyturia, and the urine culture if the stone is formed by infection process. We can do stone analysis to see morphological characteristic of stones. And then the important additional examination is imaging. We can do abdominal x-ray, KHUB, especially to differentiate opaque stone or white gray colored stone in imaging, like calcium oxalate. Intravenous pelography with contrast is to differentiate loosened stone or black gray colored stone like uric acid. Ultrasound is frequently used because it's a safe and painless test that uses stone waves. Also CT scan, the higher resolution and more 3D imaging. After we diagnose patient with nephrolithiasis, we do some treatments to patient. First is general therapy. Patient comes with pain, so we give them analgetic like NSAIDs, paracetamol. Second is specific therapy. We do conservative to evaluate asymptomatic patient. Pharmacotherapy like allopurinol, especially for uric acid stone with the size below 5 mm. There are other options if the size of the stones are bigger. Extracorporeal shock with lithotripsy, ESWL, 
no invasive treatment. Endourology, which minimal invasive include ENL, percutaneous nephrolithotomy, lithotripsy, and retrograde intraoral surgery, RIRS. We can also do surgery like laparoscopy and open surgery. Okay, as to recap, nephrolithiasis consists of two verbs, which are nephron and lith. Risk factors include intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. Stone, based on the formation process, divided into infection stone and non-infection stone. Treatments include general therapy and specific therapy to remove the kidney stones. Alright, thanks for watching this video.